The Cube research shows that new runtimes can deliver up to 75 times better performance using modern platforms. Welcome to this episode of the App Dev Angle coming to you live from the Open Source Summit North America 2025. My name is Paul Nashwaddy covering the App Dev space and all things open source. I'm joined from Sam from Allied. Yes. Sam, how you doing? Hi, how's it going? Great, great, mm -hmm. good to, great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Want to <laughs> tell the audience a little bit about yourself and about Allied? Sure, so uh, my name's Sam, I'm a software developer. Um, we made Allied because we were tired of seeing the JavaScript universe expand to the uh, detriment of all others. Uh, and we feel like that expansion has really left a dearth of activity in say Python or Java, these sort of back-end spheres. So we've made an, a runtime called Allied, which is basically Node, but from a Java-first perspective. That's, that's awesome. I mean, when we look at this, you know, we look at runtime platforms that are looking to redefine performance, cost efficiencies, and developer flexibility across multiple programming language, right? Mm -hmm. So these polyglot you know, deployments mm -hmm. are really looking for new ways of doing this, especially with these heritage environments. So I understand that you're built on Oracle Gravel G VM, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a solution that promises dramatic speed improvements are up to 75 times faster tr than traditional run times, right? Mm -hmm. We were trying to say that up front, right? <laughs> but the, while remaining um, open source mm -hmm. and drop-in ready for existing ecosystems, there's a lot here to think about, but these mm -hmm. are some lofty claims, Sam, right? Yes, when you think are. about that, so why don't we tell the audience a little bit about that? Sure, so lofty claims require uh, strong evidence, right? And uh, we're independently benchmarked, so the numbers that I'm going to give you here are either from Oracle or from a group called Tech Empower, which independently okay. benchmarks servers. Um, so we're three times faster than stock Python. We run Python. We're 75 times faster than Node.js at running JavaScript. Um, we're 24 times faster at running Ruby. Uh, and all of this is based on the technology that Oracle has created with Graal VM. These language engines are brand new, they're really well written, they're modern, and they interoperate. So in our paradigm, you can actually use multiple programming languages together. They can import from each other, they can call each other. There's no interop boundary where there's uh, overhead added, right? There's no serialization, there's no process boundary, and I'm getting very technical here, but the point is that it's already the case that many Java code bases or Python code bases also have Node in them. They right. have a bunch of Node modules, React, that they want to add for their UI. This lets you put all of that into one system, one tool chain, and use it together. So when we think about this interoperability across these different you know, polyglot uh, languages, mm -hmm. right, uh, the use cases benefit from uh, these multi-languages capabilities can really be exponential. Totally, right? exponential. Can you mm -hmm. talk about some of these use cases? Sure, so one big use case for, for polyglot, and polyglot isn't necessarily a lied's reason to exist, it's just a natural benefit that falls out of this new model, right? But, uh, but one big benefit of Polyglot is we can install packages from Maven, from PYPI, from NPM, and so all of a sudden your developers have much more software that they can pull off the shelf to do something without building themselves, right? It, it nearly triples the ecosystem that you can pull from very easily to use in your app. Right. Okay, so I open up the session with mm -hmm. 75 times more performance, right? That was kind of a little bit of a struggle, but <laughs> yeah. I got it out there. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I think about that, this is across various languages. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that number and how you got there? Sure, so, um, so some of our benchmarks, like the 3x Python stat, the 24x Ruby stat, those are the geometric mean of a language suite of benchmarks that test everything from you know, function calling to arrays to iteration. Um, then on the server side where we have JavaScript, like numbers like the 75X, that's a server benchmark. So that's okay. requests per second, right? And uh, Elide, as an example, can sustain 800,000 plus requests per second on Linux, where Next.js on Node can only do 3,000, right? And so this is a night and day difference, hundreds of thousands of more at RPS. And right? how do people know about this? Well, we're open source, we're on GitHub. Okay. Uh, we're, we've just launched beta about a month and a half ago, and we've seen a great response so far. Um, generally, when developers find us, they star us, they follow us, they want to know when this is going to be ready, and, and I think uh, stable for us is probably about three months away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about that, mm -hmm. because when we, when we think about that, you know, we want to make sure that you know, we put this out there, we get people to understand what it can do. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're kind of in the, I'll call it an alpha stage at this point. Beta for sure. Beta for sure, okay, okay. That's fair, yeah, I just, yeah. that's, that's a good, good, good way to kind of put it. Bugs but are unexpected. Of course, yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. just the way, it, it, yeah. the nature of the business, mm -hmm. right? But like, as a drop-in replacement for Node, mm -hmm. right, and Node.js, what challenges did you face with the compatibilities between, you know, the Node ecosystem and, and the partners that kind of, you know, ensure that parity mm -hmm. between the libraries and the tools? Sure, great question, actually. So, um, 
we have the same fight that new alternative node runtimes have, which is, okay. you know, you think of Deno and Bun, all of these companies kind of have to recreate the node API. Yep. Uh, we have to do that as well, but one big benefit of Allied is we're built on the JDK. So, uh, a good example would be reading a file. Um, when it comes to reading a file, if you want to do that in native code, you have to do that on six operating systems and efficiently, and it's very hard to do, and so they've got their work cut out for them. We just read a file in the JDK, which is really fast, really well tested, works on every operating system. So, yeah, our fight is a lot easier than the other ones going on right so now. So why haven't people done this before? You know, that's a great question. I think it's because um, Node was written by Ryan Dahl, who was a a, a particular fan of C++ and, and JavaScript, and that sort of is what, of it, what it took for somebody to come along and take V8 and put it on the server with the APIs needed in JavaScript. Um, we have that same bent. We love all these languages, but we're Java Kotlin first, right? And we believe that the JVM and Java and Kotlin give a richer, more powerful substrate to build a runtime in. Um, here's an example. Java's memory safe. And that means that most of a light is also memory safe, okay. right? Just by natural default. And so we think about a world where 85% of vulnerabilities and exploits today, somewhere along the line, come from memory safety, right? I mean, we could eliminate all of those in one go by switching to a better runtime. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, mm -hmm. No, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And when you think about uh, alternate runtimes, mm -hmm. uh, it's customer choice. People are figuring out what they want to do and how mm -hmm. they want to get there. They also have to look at these barriers that they need to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and part of it is, I'm thinking about it in, from the perspective of, we just recently had uh, our App Dev Summit, mm -hmm. and we, we did a number of bits of research around day zero, day one, day two, and, and you know, build, release, and operations. And you know, one of the things we were thinking about was uh, around the compilers and what's happening in the compilers. And mm -hmm. you know, when we think about it, you make a claim of 20 times faster with, you know, with the comp compiler here, yeah. right? And, and that, that is interesting because I think it also impacts some of the slowdowns you see in the CI/CD pipeline, mm -hmm. right? That's so right. So mm -hmm. if we look at it from that lens, one, validate the claim, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's talk about that. And two, let's yeah. talk about the, the CI/CD pipeline and, sure. and how you can get the release out faster. Sure. So our um, our Java compiler and our Kotlin compiler are just embedded versions of the standard Java and Kotlin compiler. And what we've done is we've made these native rather than running on JVM and as a result, there's no warm-up time. So okay. it's an identical compiler, but it doesn't take time to warm up anymore, okay. right? And so that's where we get all of our speed gains, and that's how we can hit exact same inputs, exact same outputs as the standard compilers, because it is that compiler just treated differently, I right? See. Okay. And so that's, that's one answer to your question. Uh, another answer to your question is safety uh, and security, and all of those guarantees still apply in the compiler phase. Now, um, I should say the 20X stat is like, the fastest case, right? Okay. I think users are more likely to see a 10 to 15x gain, but that's still incredible. Well, yeah, of course it is. I mean, yeah. the gain is, is you know, whether it's 10 or 20, I mean, you're talking about mm. a significant gain. Free, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. And so mm -hmm. from, a, from a, you know, tools and integration perspective, mm -hmm. there's, developers are using their bespoke solutions, they have certain tool sets that they're using, mm -hmm. the tech stack they're using. How does this platform kind of have minimal friction, especially when you're looking at existing Node.js or you know, JVM-based environments? Sure, great question. So we have plugins for Gradle and Maven. Okay. Uh, we prefer to meet users where they are, which means we're going to integrate with your build system, we're going to give you APIs that you're familiar with uh, before we design our own new APIs or, or break you, right? Like our goal is really to just meet you where you are and do a better job than your current runtime is doing. So um, we're fully compatible with Java, fully compatible with Python. Uh, Node is the only one where we sort of have this longer fight to get to parity, right? Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense. So it's mm -hmm. an evolution, mm -hmm. it's going to get there at, over time, and it's mm -hmm. uh, but but your your gains that you're seeing mm -hmm. uh, is is definitely worth the worth the investment. Oh, users can benchmark themselves. I mean, sure. you know, all we do is we compile the same code with Java C and Elide, and it's Elide Java C. <laughs> so it's you just put Elide in front of it and see it different, you know? Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So all right, let's pivot the conversation. We talked about mm -hmm. a lot on the practitioner side, mm -hmm. right? We talked a lot about the developers and how the developers are getting you know savings. Let's talk about the you know the the business decisions that are being made here, right? And when we think about this new investment, right? How do we look at uh, you know, the platform, how it reduces software development costs and cloud infrastructure costs? What types of ROI are you seeing with this? So ROI is hard to measure on this, um, and I'm not quite sure what my answer would be there yet, but I'll tell you the two mechanisms by which we save cost, or save costs for our users. Number one is uh, Java developers, Python developers, 
expensive. <laughs> yeah. React developers, plentiful and cheap. So how do you get a team of React developers and backend developers to work together? This is a runtime that allows you to interoperate, that both their code could talk to each other, it's seamless, you don't have to throw it away, you don't have to rehire people, right? Like, there's a cultural barrier that we're knocking down here. Um, by doing that, we lower the cost to develop software because those salaries can be lower for React and front-end developers. So that's one gotcha. place. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other place is by running faster, we can run for less time, and so that cuts your AWS compute bill immediately. Right? Yeah, well mm -hmm. I see that, you know, we can absolutely talk about this economic uh, validation here because mm -hmm. I think it's a big factor mm -hmm. in switching platforms, you know, moving to a new tech stack and mm -hmm. such. I think that's an important factor to look at. Absolutely. But, you know, we will also want to talk about those tangible business values, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like user experience, you were talking about that, you know, you have the collaboration between teams, mm -hmm. faster releases because mm -hmm. you have that collaboration. But faster builds. Faster yep. builds, we talked about that across the CICD pipe. Right. Uh, but also revenue impact, right? Because mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you can get this code out the door faster. But how, anything else that we're missing, other than, I mean, the performance acceleration alone is, sure. is incredible. Well, you know, one that's hard to quantify is um, what would a breach cost you that never happened? Right, and like in a, in a memory safe runtime, you can be totally sure that there's not going to be some bug where they can escape the VM and steal all of your company's data and have like a cataclysmic breach. That's an impossibility with us, right? And so, um, so, Closing those gaps for enterprise is what we see as innovation. Right? Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have a business question here. You know, mm -hmm. like when I think about the, the MIT license here that kind of goes with this, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you balance the openness between sustainability and, and the commercial side of, <laughs> of making money and support opportunities? So our answer is open source first because I think what we have what we build has to be useful for the world and with open source feedback and contributors and attention, we can make sure it is useful for the world. We want to be oriented towards everybody's needs here. Um, on the commercial side, we have plans uh, where we're going to be providing premium tool chains uh, in JVM and Android. So um, those are things that companies can purchase to accelerate their build. Um, that's separate and different from our runtime. So the runtime is always going to be open source, always free, right? Cool. Um, now those components that we're intending to charge for, in all cases, we charge less than the cost that you would incur for not using our product, right? So right. they're almost always structured to be a no-brainer. So mm -hmm. all right. So then I'll ask the question. You know, you'd say you're talking to CTOs here at the mm -hmm. audience, right? And mm -hmm. we're at open source, and you know, you're talking to, them and they're evaluating these new solutions and how to get there. And, and you're looking at you know, whether to migrate an existing workload to your platform or you know, migrate success stories uh, around this. Do you have some success stories that you can share? Not yet, we're very early. Okay. <laughs> but, here, but here's what I would say is that what we've, what we've seen work with some private design partners is like uh, dropping in a light as a compiler replacement first, right? Okay. Because brownfield projects already use these compilers. They can experience an immediate gain. There's no difference in the output that they receive. So that's just a freebie, right? Gotcha. That's where the brownfield projects come in. Greenfield, they have a whole new way to develop software, ship software that's much cheaper than before. Gotcha, right. gotcha. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting here a year from now, mm -hmm. and the next Open Source Summit, right? Where do you see this all going, and where, where's it taking off? You know, um, I think AI is here to stay, in sure. a lot of ways. I think AI is going to be local and sovereign when we get there, right? I think businesses are going to have their own AI in-house. They're not going to be paying Anthropic or OpenAI bazillions of dollars just to run their business. Uh, and I think to get there, we need to evolve on the runtime side. So Allied, for instance, can run local AI very easily. So we've made that super easy so that your developers can take your private data, keep it sovereign on site, but have the whole chat interface that you want, right? So, yeah, um, yeah I think in a year, we're going to be back here, we're going to have a booth. <laughs> nice. It's going to be the nicest booth, I <laughs> hope. That's great. That's that's great. I know, well look, I mean, I think you've, uh, congratulations on the successes you've had Thank so you. far. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I really think you, you're, giving, you're going to give the industry a run for the money, right? I think it's a, <laughs> it's a great, great thing. I mean, performance is, is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to thank you for your time and your insights. Thank it's you been for great. having me. And thank you for joining me today. I'm Paul Nash, already coming to you live from the show floor at Open Source Summit North America 2025. Thank you to the audience for watching, for theCUBE, the leading source for tech news.